talk about Steely Dan for a bit. On the um, one side of the Asia LP, you have Tom Scott on Black Cow. You you have um, Pete Chrislieb on Deacon Blues, and you got Wayne Shorter. You couldn't get anybody good, they could they? I know Pete Chrislieb is another one. I should have I, sh I should have included him in that list of people I mentioned. Pete, I I, I met when I was about fourteen years old. There was a it was a youth band. Uh, uh, initiated by Ollie Mitchell, who was a great trumpet player, a studio trumpet player back in those days. And they had a rehearsal uh, facility, and I, I, I wanted to join the band so badly. So I walk in the door, and then there's this tall, I don't know, I was 14, maybe he was 16, I don't know, maybe like that. And he's like playing this fantastic solo. And I go, oh my God, who is that? If I can ever play anything like him, I, I will have made it. And of course it was Pete Chrisley. Yeah. And we became dear friends. And I, uh, I, I used him on every, any, any TV or movie session uh, I could get him on. Uh, he, I wanted him there because that beautiful sound. And, of course, he was also a, 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 <laughs> a classic curmudgeon. He always had some very funny things to say, uh, sometimes about the business, sometimes about who knows what. But I just, he was, you know, <laughs> I... I used to love to fill my sessions with, uh, what did I call them? You know, loudmouths, curmudgeons, and, and just, uh, you know, bullshitters. <laughs> because they, they always were so entertaining between the, the, between the music. You know what I mean? It was always, a, it, was, it felt in a way like a wonderful party, a gathering, of just, just great individuals and obviously very talented individuals. At what point in, in, Steely Dan recordings did you get the tunes that you were going to add horn section parts to right well um i i had met um Walter Becker the other one half of Steely Dan of course through a mutual friend and uh so i got a call from him saying look we are working on our new album Steely Dan and uh I wondered if you could, you know, come down and listen and maybe write some horn arrangements. I was like, great, because Steely Dan was already, you know, a very hot uh, property. So uh, I walk into, into uh, Village Recorders in, in West Los Angeles and uh, sit when I meet uh, Donald Fagan and their producer. Um, I can't think of his name right now, but uh, but look, Do Donald and Walter, you know, led the led the proceedings. So they played me the tunes. They told me, here's what they said, we want, we want a lot of horns, you know. He says, but we don't, we don't want any, like, high screaming trumpet parts. I said, okay, I, I, I won't write high screaming trumpet parts. Um, but we ended up with, we agreed on a section that was, I think, four saxes, two trombones, two trumpets. I think that's what it turned mm -hmm. out to be. So uh, they gave me a reel-to-reel -reel tape in those days, of course, of, uh, of the tunes except for um, Asia, of course, which is the tune that has the Wade Shorter solo and didn't require any, any horn uh, sweetening. So I go home, and I began to write. And uh, we, we, had, uh, we had set up sessions. I hired the band, which included, let's see, Pete. I think Pete couldn't do it because they were night sessions, and he was doing the Tonight Show at the time. But I got Plas Johnson, Jackie Kelso, another, another wonderful saxophone player, Bill Perkins, another mm -hmm. saxophone player, and Jim myself, Horn. We, Jim Horn was on it too. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Okay, uh, I, it's, according it's to the, my notes here, I, I'm sure it's right if you say so. And Chuck Finley and somebody else on trumpet, I don't remember who, and uh, Slide Hyde and somebody else, maybe Lou McCreary on trumpet. Yes, I mean, on trombone. I mean, and Plas Johnson also. Yeah, yeah, Plas. Yes. Yeah. So uh, we it was supposed to be. Uh, let's see. I think we did it. We had four sessions, evening sessions planned to do all, was it eight tunes, seven tunes, eight tunes? I'm not sure. Uh, and uh, I had written, you know, they, they had given me their master rhythm parts, which the, which the rhythm section had used to make their tracks. And <clears throat> if I make it technical for a second, the tune um, uh, 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 Deacon Blues started out with a chord which was a, a, just a triad, 
it was a, it was a uh, E minor, you could call it an E minor chord with a G in the bass. G in the bottom, E and B. That's what the rhythm section played, the very first chord. Now that chord kept coming up later in the, at the point where I was supposed to come in with horns. So you know, I've got all these horns. I'm not, gonna, I'm not just going to play three notes. <laughs> that would be ridiculous. So I, I did, I pulled what I, I used to refer to as an Oliver Nelson because Oliver was my hero and my mentor. And uh, he, he loved those very close, juicy voicings where the, where the juicy notes, you know, the extended parts of the chord are not up here, but they're right in the middle. So um, I took that, uh, that, that first chord, that uh, e, e minor G bass, and turned it into a G13 chord. So it was G on the bottom, and then uh, E, the E uh, below middle C, and then F, A, B, and E on top. So it's like a G13, uh, uh, you know, with, a, with the, the E part, the, thir the 13th part in octaves. So, okay. right? Yeah. So, that, so that's, you know, and that kind of went on that way with, with those tight voicings. And, uh, you know, I didn't know, man. I had no idea how they would react. Uh, but they liked it. And in fact, with the exception of one tune, and it was Deacon Blues, everything went as, as written. Talk about, you know, good fortune smiling on Tom. Uh, but the only tune that I had to change was a tune in which they had inserted something after, the, after they gave me these tapes. And the thing they had inserted was Pete Chrisley's solo. On Deacon Blues, I had written something else in there, and I had to redo that and and, and make a I guess a background or I forget what I did. Okay. But in any case, Pete's solo on on Deacon Oof. Blues is just just monumental. Especially when you hear the long version and it's fading out. You're right. Oh yes, the the fade the fade licks. I know. Well, Pete, you know, Pete was fantastic. I mean, it is fantastic. He always was and always will be. Just a just a. A tremendously underrated talent, you know what I mean? You know, there's something about that song I love. It, it, it's, it's lyrically, and Fagan sings, I'll learn to work the saxophone. Yes. And I often wondered, did he first write, I'll learn to play the saxophone? Just that's a that, great question. That's just I, that you know, word I, is so hip. <laughs> I don't know. You know, listen, they obviously... Uh, whether it was Becker or Fagan or both of them together, they really had a flair for interesting lyrics, which evoked, uh, you know, they weren't, they weren't, they sort of rode the line between what half expected and half unexpected. Uh, and that was one of the unexpected turns. I think they, you know, they prided themselves in that lyrically. They were, they were well known for sort of a re revolving door of, guitar players coming in and out and i i wonder <laughs> <laughs> did you ever have a circumstance where you played a solo on a steely dan song and when it came out it was somebody else <laughs> no, no <laughs> I'm in, fact, glad that... in fact i i you know i used to say i consider myself very lucky that i made it through that week without any changes because uh you know with the exception of deacon blues uh because as i used to say there's you know, bodies of drummers, bass players, and guitarists strewn out the door and down Santa Monica Boulevard of those who uh, tried and failed. And I, I, you know, I I never understood that because obviously they were looking for something, and they kept they kept trying until they got it. But the thing they were looking for was never clear to me. How different would it have been with Bernard Purdy as opposed to say Steve Gadd or? Rick Marotta, or you know, it would have been a little different. But did, how did they know that in front? How did, you know? I think you have to try a bunch of. I, I suppose you try a bunch of players, and then you maybe you know what? Maybe they decided you know what? We had it with the first drummer, so the, the, in other words, the last one to play on it didn't necessarily end up on the record. Oh, true. That's true. Yeah, I, I don't know that for a fact. I, sh I, I did a podcast with Walter Becker, I mean, with Donald Fagan. I, I should have asked him that. Uh, crap, I, I blew it. Here's a quote from one of your colleagues about um, those years. And, and he said, this isn't playing, it's craft. 
LA is an incredible place for craft. Your soul is not usually nurtured. Well, I don't I don't agree with that. I I, I had a that. feeling from what you've said so far that that you would not. No. No, my soul was nurtured every day. Okay. I love my work. I mean, look, uh, there were sessions I did where I didn't necessarily like the, uh, there were pop sessions we did. Um, I'm referring, the ones that come to mind are the ones that we used to do with a guy named Wes Farrell, who, who for a t brief time was married to uh, uh, one of Sinatra's daughter, daughters, Tina. And he was a real, I don't know, <laughs> Mike Melvoin called him a starker. I guess that means sort of a poser. He was a poser. He always dressed very elegantly and had the had the talk. He was a fast talking New Yorker, you know, was like that. And he produced uh, all the Partridge Family records and David Cassidy, and uh, there were a bunch of them. And so we we the horn section, which was at the time I think it was me, Chuck Finley, Ollie Mitchell, who I mentioned before, uh, uh, Slide Hyde, and Lou McCreary, we would go in to do the horns overdubs. And Mike Melvoin wrote these horn charts, most of them, and sometimes uh, Jim Hewart. So even though the tune was kind of, I don't know, dumb <laughs> or mundane, uh, you know, it, it, it didn't matter because we were there to play the best damn horn section you've ever heard in your life. So we took our part very seriously within what we were doing. We didn't know how, how far the mix it was going to be or whether it was going to be there at all. We didn't really care. It wasn't our job. Our job was to go in there and play with one another, which we which we took great joy in doing. And whatever the music is, man, we'll we'll, we'll play. We'll just nail it. So that was that was that was you know soul gratifying just to do that, regardless of the artist. Did you ever get to the point? Um, I'll preface this by I was able to do an interview with Oliver Nelson Jr. Right, and he said. Um, that his father was afraid to turn down work. That he felt if he started turning down jobs that he, you know, would sink down on the list. And consequently, um, he just kept doing it until he couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> did you ever feel like, okay, I did four sessions today Maybe I should not keep doing that. Well, rarely did I do ever. I don't think I ever did four sessions. Okay. The rhythm guy, the rhythm section guys did. They 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 could work from morning till late at night. Uh, that was very very rare with me. Um, but there were times, in, in the words of uh, of uh, Earl, uh, the great drummer, great Earl Palmer. Drummer, Earl Palmer. Yeah. He he said. You know, sometimes it comes to a point when you're in a session and it just keeps going, going, you go, don't want to make any more money. I just want to go home. <laughs> and there were, were there some moments like that? Sure. Um, but in the main, it was, uh, it was, it was fun to be there. It was really great. I, as I say, I didn't, I didn't work those kind of day early in the morning, all the way till late at night. Uh, I can't think of one. I, there may have been a couple, but uh, I don't remember. If you wanted to take a two-week vacation in those days, was that um, a little risky? Well, the thing is, you've, you've got to get to a point where you're comfortable in the fact that you have a career and you will get called even if you take off a couple of weeks, um, which I did. You know, I, I, we, me and my first wife uh, took vacations. Uh, to, we went to Hawaii a couple of times, and uh, it, it never bothered me. You know, I... I because there seemed to be that the calls seemed to keep coming in and back to Oliver uh, Oliver's I think Oliver was wrong in the sense that as Lou Adler said to me once Tom you sometimes it's a good idea to keep yourself um, a little bit of a mystery about you uh, you become more uh, interesting when you when you when you're you know not taking something for a while like ooh he's got he's got the bigger plans or he's got a you know, just an image of what, what he's going to accept. See, because Oliver could have done more mo motion pictures, for example. But doing that show, Six Million Dollar Man, every single week and insisting on or composing and orchestrating everything, 
they were on a much quicker schedule than, than I ever was. It was like once a week, man, there was a show. So we had like seven days to, to write an entire score for us, that show. And he, you know, he, he did drink. And I think he uh, 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 complicated by alcohol and, mm-hmm. and working till he was just exhausted. He went home after a session, morning session for a $6 million man, and laid down and passed away. That's what happened. And you mentioned almost in passing that he could have um, passed on some of the work, like the orchestration, yes. to other people. Yes, mm-hmm. he could have, but he just didn't want to. Again, I think it's that thing is I've got to do everything. I've got to just be the Mr. Wonderful, you know, in every possible way as a composer. And uh, you don't have to. You know, there are very successful composers who had orchestrators throughout their careers. Well, before I forget, I wanted to tell you my one of my first early exposures to you was um, spontaneous combustion. Oh, my Lord. Yeah, wow. I had the I had the record. That was a very long time ago. Yes, about a young. And that boy. was that was a record with it featured much of the L.A. Uh, studio, you know, guys and, mm-hmm. and 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 I think did we have a singer? Or not? I can't remember. Anyway, it was like the Baylor Tom and John Baylor, who were singers, and and uh, uh, John was an arranger, also, and uh, gosh. Mike Melvoin, Jim Horn on saxophone, uh, again, uh, <laughs> Ollie Mitchell, Chuck Finley on trumpets, uh, Slide Hyde, I, it may have been, I can't remember who the other trombone player was, maybe George Bohannon, and uh, who played drums? John Guerin played drums, Max Bennett on bass, I think maybe Larry Carlton on guitar. It was really, the, you know, the cream of the crop rhythm section and horns at, in those days. Before we get to uh, get to talk about your your own solo recordings, what has happened to the business? I think of all the jazz graduate uh, coming out of the schools every year, and many of them must head for L.A. Is there any? What's the business like for them to head to these days? Not great, not great. Uh, I would put it to you this way. There's far more qualified musicians than there is work to keep them busy. And that's a problem. Problem we didn't have back then. But but we have it now. The sessions are few and far between as we've gone to much computer-generated music. And, uh, and uh, you know, the advent of, of uh, music that's basically free off the Internet or, or for... Or, purchasable for our pittance there's no there's no interest in in doing a record for profit it's just not profitable anymore so uh you know there's just the opportunities just aren't out there so your timing was good (laughs) thank you lord yes yeah when you got ready to do uh, a solo recording what came first, the the band, the material, or the or the agreement from a record company? Well, my very first album was for Bob Thiel of Impulse, and he he I uh, I figured out that he thought he could make me into kind of a pop saxophone player. Uh, I thought I think maybe he thought he could get a pop instrumental hit. Uh, from my uh, album, my first album. It was called Honeysuckle Breeze, which was an original tune composed by Ian Freebaron Smith, one of the arrangers. I basically just walked in and, and played the charts that were put in front of me. So uh, I guess I had signed the contract with Impulse, a typical record deal at that time. I think it was probably a, a deal for four, three or four albums. Um, one per year uh and of course the record company had the option every year to pick up or drop me um and a and a, and a royalty rate which was pathetically small by by today's standards um 
But uh, on the other hand, you know, that, that, that was a different era. The record companies put a lot of money into marketing, promotion, um, and advertising. And, uh, and of course, they, they did all of that uh, at, at, at a certain amount of expense to, uh, to them. And they had big buildings with employees. I mean, they had a big nut to, nut to pay. So, I mean, I, I'm sympathetic on the one hand, but uh, I didn't expect to make money off my record. I hoped I would. But, uh, again, I think that, that probably the, the contra, record contract came first and then, uh, then the session, the, the recording itself. As I say, the chart, the, I just were, there was a stand with arrangements on it, and I just played them with all these wonderful, uh, again, sort of uh, 60s um, uh, wrecking crew uh, uh, musicians, uh, Carol Kay on bass, Mike Melvoin on keyboards, um, Emil Richards on percussion, Jim Gordon on drums, and B Glenn Campbell on rhythm guitar. He was not yet a star and was doing rhythm, rhythm uh, guitar sessions as a session player. And uh, I think Dennis Budimir was the other. I mean, these were all the guys that were busy studio players in the pop music scene at the time. So the, it wasn't a jazz record. Although, you know, I played some licks that I suppose you could classify as jazz. Um, but uh, so that, that's how it happened. Well, there was a time especially in the 50s and 60s where you could have an instrumental hit you know cast your fate to the wind and uh stranger stranger on the shore right acker bilk yes vince garaldi i remember them all the, well but when you got to the point where you know you had a, a reputation and you were doing solo recordings i'm wondering how much thought did you give to fitting into what niche? Was it going to be jazz rock? Was it, um, or maybe this didn't even occur to you. Maybe you were just composing music and looking for tunes that you liked. Pretty much the, uh, the, the latter. I, uh, I, I, I was in New York, I can't remember why, but I, I got to see Bob Thiel in his office um, at Impulse Records at the time, and it was time to do another album, second album. And he said, Tom, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to do a jazz album with my, with my quartet, which at the time was Mike Lang on piano, Chuck DeMonaco on bass, and John Guerin on drums. And so he said, cool. So back in Los Angeles, I walked into uh, uh, United Recording, uh, recording Studio. Uh, Bob was in the booth. And his engineer, a guy named Eddie Bracken, I'll never forget him because he, boy, I don't know whether he was uh, on stimulants or what he was doing, but he was like, he was at that board. And he, and again, in that day, in those days, it was like rotary pots, uh, you know, it, it, that went like the round knobs that you turn for volume up and down. And he'd sit there at that board and he'd, oh my God, I thought the guy's going to have a heart attack. I think eventually he did. But uh, anyway, so we, I went in there with my quartet and made what I consider to be a jazz album. I mean, it was a jazz album. And uh, there's a funny story connected with that, actually, which involves the shooting of the cover. The cover was uh, uh, determined to, by Bob to, uh, uh, well, the title of the album was determined to be Rural Still Life, which was the opening track of the album, a tune that Mike Lang had written. So uh, I got a call from the photographer one day. He says, listen, Bob Thiel has asked me to shoot your cover. And uh, it said, it since it's, he told me it's rural still life. So he says, I know this place out in the north uh, San Fernando Valley where they have, you know, horses and cabins and sort of a western uh, uh, little, you know, community. So he said, let's. Let's go out there, bring your band, and we'll find a place to shoot the cover with a band. I said, great. So uh, we found this cabin, this un unoccupied cabin, and we uh, posed in front of it and took the picture, and then, which became the cover of the record, Rural Still Life. Um, about six months later, that cabin and that surrounding area became the home of the Charles Manson family. It was the Spawn Movie Ranch. <laughs> and we got out of there just in time, I always like to say. <laughs> so that 
probably um, increases the value of that LP if you can find it. Well, uh, you know, don't know, very few people know about that story except the ones I've told. So, which is your uh, favorite? I'll rephrase. Do you think of yourself as when you saxophone player as my alto is more of my jazz horn, my tenor is more of my pop horn, or <laughs> is that not relevant? It's a good question. Um, I, I think in my mind, I'm. I mean, I, look, I play I play pop music on alto and tenor and jazz on alto and tenor. Uh, I think if you were to ask me to pick the the instrument that I'm that I feel most comfortable about, you know, playing jazz on, it's probably the alto. Um, and and of course, Cannonball Adderley especially has been an incredible influence on my playing, and continues to be to this day. Oh, look at him! Oh man, what a player! Oh, I had that Lord. ready because you and I uh, share that. I yeah. I think he's the, he's the tops. He just um... absolutely, absolutely, and you you know back when I was uh, you know. 57, 58, 59, of course, when all those great um, Miles Davis sextet albums were recorded. I used to, I have told people, I've told kids at, 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 uh, at um, you know, when I teach, that uh, trying to explain the difference between those three soloists, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, and Cannibal Adderley. You know, Miles, and this, these are generalizations, of course, but, you know, it's more or less true, that Miles was very sophisticated and very, played, you know, he held back a lot. He'd go, Papo, Papo, do do, and you just wait for the note. What's he gonna do next? You know, actually, he you create a great deal of drama by doing that. You just draw people in by playing less. <laughs> then there's Coltrane, who was on this search. They used to call it sheets of sound, but he's, to me, it sounded like he was on this incredible, unbelievable, fantastic search you know he and tons of notes and man it was like amazing and then cannibal comes on and he's like hey great day isn't it you know just happy just real happy and 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 that's i that's the attitude that i always related to because that was really me more than the other people although i as i say i admired both miles and coltrane i have all their records and it's my, between those three people, Miles, Coltrane, and Cannonball, those are the three biggest uh, record collection, uh, parts of my record collection, those three. And he was so effective as a band leader and a speaker. I mean, he just yes. was so hip. He'd stand up there, and I got to see him a number of times, and I just was so sucked into him. His vibe. music. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, he was a teacher in Florida, as mm -hmm. I understand. Uh, but what a player, man! What a what a marvelous player. I still, you know, the one that kills me from a, it's an album called Nip on Soul, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a rec there's a tune called Easy to Love, the Cole Porter tune, Easy to Love. He plays at its breakneck speed, and he plays the most phenomenal solo that goes on and on he never repeats himself but it's just you cannot believe the creativity and genius uh displayed in that solo it's unbelievable it, it's like that recording of um spectacular that uh it's like spectacular <laughs> it's, um, I but the, i always we can get off this momentarily but it's interesting that one of his biggest hits was of course mercy mercy which right. he does not solo on no but i like to tell my students the greatest note ever played on the saxophone is when he goes ba ba da 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 i got gotcha. you that's that's right that's exactly right it just hits you it hits you I see that uh, hip-looking microphone there, and uh, is is that what you use for your podcast? Uh, no, it's it's not actually. I, I use I have um, I have this little machine here. Uh, I'm I'm a, I'm a I'm a uh, artist uh, for Zoom audio products. Uh, I use this little thing, which oh. is the uh, PodTrack. I see. I think it's 
pod truck, I think it's called. And uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. The, the, you know, the microphone goes in the back, headphones go in the front, and uh, it goes USB in the, in the computer. So who's ever on the computer, it records them on one track and me on another. It records separate tracks inside this little machine. Yeah, I listened to a couple of them, including Donald Fagan. I, I wonder how you prepare for your sessions. My podcast sessions? Yes. Well, I do research. I do all the research I can come up with, and then given all the information I can garnish, uh, I try to uh, ask questions that I'd want to ask, questions that I think people would want to know about, and just I list them. You know, I list them and uh, and go try to put them in kind of some kind of chronology. I always ask people, it, it, but the but the overall picture of my podcast, as I see it, is that the life of a successful person in whatever field has sort of three parts. There's the part where they're young, growing up, and then something happens that triggers their thought about doing this thing that they ended up doing so successfully. If it was a, something they saw, someone they knew, how that happened. There's a, you know, there's like a flashpoint. And then the second part is that bridge. How if you get from there to ultimate success? And that, of course, is always a very interesting part of anyone's life. And then, of course, discussing their success. But, but I, you know, I'm, I don't consider myself like an interviewer on The Tonight Show where I want to know your latest, uh, your latest outings. I, I, because I think people need, want and need to know the story of, of, of these successful people and that nobody, you know, was born successful. There, there's a lot of sweat, work, effort, and, you know, and disappointment sometimes in getting there and uh it, it, you know i want people to know that if they if they're if they want to do something bad enough and are willing to put that at the forefront of their efforts you know th they'd be amazed at what they could achieve and not not take defeat as anything but a challenge to be overcome nice words of wisdom um you've been at we've been at this for some time and i very much appreciate your your time what makes or made in the past producers call you rather than all those other terrific saxophonists in, in your mind? What was it about Tom Scott's sound and approach that got you all those calls? You know what? I honestly, I don't know. I, you'd have to ask them. <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, I was one of the guys. One of the, the, the pro I'm going to guess now, but I would suspect there's something that I did prior to them calling me that they liked and they wanted on their project. But Did you think rhythmically first when you were doing this? Uh, I don't know if that's a good question or not. Uh, most of the pop recordings don't require a lot of harmonic development no so the rhythm of your solos is obviously extremely important yeah it is but but i don't i don't I, i'm not analyzing it from from a from a you know brain standpoint i'm reacting emotionally and uh sometimes i'll have them play in the before i've gone in the studio to do the solo i'll have them play that eight or 16 bar section for me and i'll listen to it and, and try to get a vision, you know, of what, you know, what, what I'm going to play and the feel of it. And sometimes some ideas will come to me, you know, in, just in thinking about it. Okay, so I've got the general feel. Now I'm going to go out there. If you ask me to play eight, eight different soul, uh, uh, tracks, you're going to get eight different solos. But you'll I, I know that you'll find there are similarities between all of them because I, I sort of mold a general direction and it's going to it's going to show up in all those tracks somewhere what's on uh, your docket these days well right now of course uh i'm doing some uh some gratis work <laughs> uh uh of course i've got my podcast i've got a radio show on k k kjzz which is the uh, southern california jazz station i've got a weekly jazz show there called hang time with tom scott i'm doing of course i've done a lot of uh, i got on tiktok uh at the recommendation of my the guy who's now my producer uh, in connecticut actually um and so i've got a whole series of tiktoks where 
uh, they're sort of two-part TikToks. The first one is where I play that portion of a record where I've soloed. And I, I'll, I'll take that. I bought a green screen. And so I will mime that solo in this green screen and then send that to my guy in, in, uh, in Connecticut. And he puts the, the album, the cover of the album I'm playing, unlike if it's Carole King, Jasmine, or Paul McCartney and Wings, whatever it is, in the background. That's one TikTok. And then the second one is where I talk, yes, I did play, you know, the solo on Carole King's Jasmine, and here's how it happened. And I tell the story of going to the studio and like that. So I must have probably 30 pairs of TikToks. I'm, I'm at Tom Scott Jazzman, if anybody wants to look. Nice. And uh, so there's that, uh, the radio show. Um, I'm also, uh, well, I, I've, I've, I've got, uh, I'm still working on uh, my, my upcoming, I'm doing an album here and probably this summer. Uh, and uh, it's going to be, you know, I hate to say LA Express because it could end up being the New York Express. Um, we're, we're still debating whether to do it. I'm going to New York in, uh, in July to teach, as I have done two or three years uh, back, uh, at the summer jazz program. Um, this year, oddly enough, I'll be teaching audio engineering, um, which, of course, I have done, but I've done it from the, from the standpoint of a musician. There's, an, there's actually three of us, uh, me, and then there's a guy who actually is a full-time audio engineer, he, he is the engineer for um, Saturday Night Live, among other things. But he's, I think, on staff at NYU, where this is taking place. And the third guy is like a, a, like a hip-hop guy, a loop guy. So, so between the three of us, they'll get a, a, a real full picture of, uh, of what it's like sitting in a board. And, of course, I am proud to say that I am a Hawaiian Grammy-winning producer. Uh, I, I produced a record for a young girl. Uh, named Brittany Paiva, who was a wonderful ukulele player in, in uh, Hawaii. And we did a whole album with her, some jazz tunes, some, some uh, folky, folkish kind of tunes, even one classical tune. We did the Foray Pavan, kind of in the style of the Bill Evans with Symphony Orchestra mm-hmm. record. And I, except for her playing and a couple of jazz soloists that I got on the record, um, Arturo Sandoval, Ray Parker, and Michael McDonald did a whole bunch of vocals on, on one of his tunes. But the rest was all me, drums and bass and keyboards and strings and everything, and and engineered it, and uh, uh, for that. Uh, so I do know how a board works. And, of course, back in the days when I was doing my own records uh, regularly, uh, my engineer, Hank Sicalo, uh well, there were other engineers, but primarily he's the one that comes to mind because I did LA Express, New York Connection, all that stuff with him. I would, he, he would, uh, it was on a 24 track machine, you've got 24 faders there. So he would take the front 16, which was the drums, the rhythm section basically, and I would take the back eight, which would be all the overdubs, the saxes, woodwinds, anything else. So we would mix the thing manually, of course, in those days. There was no uh, automatic floating faders. Well, they were, but we didn't have them. And so we did it all manually. And so I do know the board. Oh. And so I can bring some. Uh, wisdom to that area i hope let me just wrap up i forgot to ask about um paul mccartney who over the years definitely knew what he wanted i i think of the penny lane trumpet solo and apparently how he vocalized it and had george martin write it down right when you played on that wings track um did he tell you what to play well, you know, if you'll give me just a second, I will. I can read you from a quote from Paul McCartney himself. So, uh, in in a in a subsequent article after the record came out, uh, an issue of Rolling Stone, uh, Paul said, and I quote: "We were in Los Angeles. Listen to what the man said was one of the songs we had high hopes for, but when we did the backing track, we thought it didn't really get it together at all." Someone said Tom Scott lived very near, so we said, give him a ring. He turned up in half an hour. He put his headphones on and started playing along casually. Meanwhile, the engineer was recording it. No one could believe it. He had all this feeling on his first take. And, it, and in fact, uh, I, I thought I was just playing along to learn the tune. My eyes were closed and I had no idea that I was being recorded. In fact, when, I, when the thing ended, 
I looked up and everybody was applauding in the in the booth. And then I go, oh, wait, 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 wait a minute. I don't even know. You know, it was a totally unconscious uh, take. So I said, let me do one more because now I know the tune. Of course, you can you can well imagine the take that went on the final record. It's that one that was just pure feel. My my face is hurting from smiling so much, Tom. <laughs> That's just marvelous. Uh, well, I want to thank you again for your time. This has no been problem. like a, sort of a nice fantasy of mine, and uh, you made it come true. <laughs> well, I was glad to do it. Happy to do it. Your questions are great, and uh, I hope it uh, serves the purpose. Great. And well, welcome. Uh, I hope that your projects go well and that you keep doing what you're doing and i'm glad you didn't fall back on the fall back on <laughs> no no i didn't i sure All right. didn't